I have always been of the mindset that you can make successful astrophotos with pretty much any kind of gear. But there is definitely something special about being able to use the very highest spec piece of gear on the market. On this trip, I had the privilege of using the Sigma 14mm f1.4 DG-DN art lens, the largest aperture 14mm rectilinear full-frame lens ever made. The Sigma 14mm f1.4 is a lens of superlatives. With its f1.4 aperture, it's the fastest and largest aperture full-frame 14mm ever made. And that also means it's the widest full-frame rectilinear f1.4 lens ever made. As an astrophotographer, I've dreamed about and wished for such a lens for over a decade. Sigma says this lens was designed specifically for astrophotography. Okay, we can't ignore the obvious. There is no escaping physics with this lens. With 19 lens elements in 15 groups, made up of numerous super low dispersion, ultra low dispersion, and aspherical lens elements, the engineers at Sigma pulled no punches when designing this lens. As a result, it's one of the largest and heaviest ultra wide angle prime lenses that I've ever used. Without the lens cap, the Sony E-mount version of the lens that was loaned to me by Sigma weighs just over 1.1 kilograms, which is just over two and a half pounds. No matter how you look at that, that's a big lens. It dwarfs my compact A7C camera body, and I can only imagine what the L-mount version of the lens looks like mounted to one of Sigma's own FP or FPL camera bodies. To keep such a large lens balanced, the 14mm f1.4 is designed with an integrated tripod socket and mounting shoe. Like other large Sigma telephoto lenses, the mounting shoe has a built-in ARCA-compatible dovetail for mounting directly to most tripod clamps. The tripod socket is removable, but in most cases, you're likely going to be wanting to use this lens on a tripod anyways. Also, like other Sigma art lenses, it's built extremely nicely. It has the same design language and the same fit and finish as Sigma's other DG, DN art lenses made for full frame mirrorless. It has a dedicated aperture ring that can be declicked or locked in automatic mode, and it has a standard AF-MF switch and an AFL button. And like Sigma's recent 20mm and 24mm DG, DN art lenses, the 14mm 1.4 also features a manual focus lock switch, which is exceptionally convenient for landscape astrophotography and time-lapse shooting when you want to make sure that the focus does not shift at all during the course of the night. This lens has a large convex front element and an integrated front lens hood, so its lens cap is one of the large cylindrical designs, which is pretty typical of most 14mm lenses. This one has a pinch style locking mechanism and also features something I've never seen before on a lens cap, two integrated filter slot holders for storing thin film gel filters. The Sigma 14mm f1.4 Art can take these gel filters in a slot behind the rear element. And Sigma even includes a tracing pattern for cutting your own gel sheets to fit perfectly into the rear filter slot. This lens is supposed to be available by late June 2023 with a suggested price of 1,599 US dollars. It's notable that that's the same price as Sony's 14 millimeter F 1.8 GM lens, which makes the Sigma exceptionally competitively priced while also being two thirds of a stop brighter. To test out the Sigma 14 millimeter F 1.4, I traveled with my brother-in-law to my local dark sky spot in Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park in Central Florida. Kissimmee Prairie has dedicated astro pads, which are basically campsites with power and mandated rules for limiting white light usage. We arrived with a waxing moon in the sky in the earlier part of the night, so initially we set up a small telescope to observe and shoot the moon while I got myself familiar with using the 14mm lens. One of the challenges of shooting on a humid Florida night is developing condensation on the lens. And Sigma designed the front of the 14mm f1.4 such that the lens hood steps out to a slightly larger diameter. And this allows the use of a lens dew heater such that it won't slip forward and start showing up in the edges of the image. It's a subtle design element, but it's one that I can definitely appreciate. 
Now, I admittedly struggled a little bit to dial in perfect focus with this lens initially. Even though it's an ultra wide angle lens, it still has a fairly narrow depth of field at f1.4, and that means it can be a bit of a challenge to make sure that the focus on the stars is spot on. Once I did get my focus dialed in, I locked the focus with the manual focus lock switch, and I shot some wide star field shots of the sky to test the aberration performance of the lens. Pinpoint stars are a notoriously challenging subject for a lens because even the smallest aberration can distort or smear the appearance of stars, especially on the edges of the frame. This is a full frame image shot wide open at f1.4 with a six second exposure at ISO 640. This is an exported RAW with no adjustments except for Lightroom's default sharpening and noise reduction and a Sigma supplied pre-release profile correction, which is applied for distortion, but I intentionally disabled any kind of vignetting correction. The moon was still up, hence the blue tint in the sky. Looking at the full frame, the stars all pretty much look like perfect pinpoints, so that's an extremely welcome sight. Vignetting is also surprisingly well controlled. So basically at normal viewing distances, the photos from the Sigma 14 millimeter f1.4 appear aberration free. Now let's take a closer look. Zooming into the center of the image at 300%, and we can see that the stars still look pretty much like perfect pinpoints, just as we would expect. And when we zoom into the edges, everything still looks pretty good, but there's a very slight drop in sharpness, particularly in the sagittal direction. At the very extreme corners, you can see that there are some tiny wings that are visible on the very brightest stars, meaning we have a little bit of sagittal astigmatism. Overall, however, I wanna highlight just how exceptionally minor this aberration is. It's only apparent in the very extreme corners and for the very brightest stars. We only see it stretching the star about two pixels on either side of the star center on my 24 megapixel A7 III. I would have no hesitation using this lens at f1.4 for pretty much all of my astrophotography. The tiny amount of aberration that is present is also virtually eliminated by stopping down just one stop to f2, so that's still an option if you need it. Overall, this is an excellent result for such an extreme lens design. Something to keep in mind when using this lens at f1.4 is that it has a fairly narrow depth of field. That means if you're shooting at all with a close foreground while focused on the stars, the foreground is likely going to be noticeably out of focus. So for this shot of the rising Milky Way, I focus stacked by shooting three separate exposures, one focused on the stars, one on the mid-ground, and one on the foreground before blending them together with Photoshop's automatic focus stacking mode. Now, one of the things that I was most excited to try with this lens is hyperlapse. With the f1.4 aperture and an ultra-wide field of view, this lens seemed like the perfect candidate to attempt hyperlapse. I was able to keep exposure times to a relatively short six seconds, which made it possible to shoot each frame of the hyperlapse relatively quickly. Now, if I were to shoot more hyperlapses with this lens, I think it would greatly benefit from the use of a tripod mounted gimbal in order to provide better initial stabilization. I shot my hyperlapses completely manually on a fixed tripod, so the initial result did end up being relatively shaky, and DaVinci Resolve was not able to automatically stabilize my result. So instead, I managed to feed all of my frames through the panorama stitching software PT GUI by masking out the foreground and then using its automatic panorama frame alignment to output a series of fairly well aligned and stabilized frames. Astrophotography hyperlapse creation is one of those challenges that I would probably only ever approach with a large aperture lens like this, both for the ease of framing and because it's possible to keep exposure times relatively short in order to be able to capture as many frames as possible in a given amount of time. Being able to use f1.4 allowed me to use that six second exposure versus say a 10 second exposure that would have been needed for an f1.8 lens to gather the same amount of light. The Sigma 14mm f1.4 made this process that much easier just because of its bright aperture. I think my initial attempts, while rudimentary, worked surprisingly well even when shooting fully manually without a gimbal. All during this portion of the night, the moon was still relatively bright, so it cast a deep blue color on the atmosphere and reduced a lot of the contrast and color of the Milky Way. I left the Sigma 14mm 1.4 shooting time-lapse while we waited for the moon to set. 
And once down, I shot a few more stills of the galactic center directly to the south of the astropaths. Feeling pressed for time to get some more compositions in before sunrise and to get a better angle on the setting Milky Way, I figured we'd benefit from moving shop towards the entrance road of the park. One thing that is notable is that from the very start of my hyperlapse shooting all the way through my stills and time lapses until sunrise, I never needed to recheck my focus. I kept the lens on manual focus lock and it held it there at infinity focus the entire night, even with numerous power cycles of the camera and even one battery swap. So I'm uh, running a time lapse right now, uh, just of the sunrise. We had a pretty interesting morning. We started hearing this like, like really kind of like low, like rumble, like almost like a growl sound. Um, kind of sort of, it sort of sounded like somebody like trying to start an engine or something like that. Kind of like a, just like a low rumble. You know, I was, we were kind of joking like, oh, you know, it's like probably like an alligator or something like that. My brother-in-law looked up the sound of an like an alligator bellows online and played it and it was exactly the same sound like just like like a perfect imitation of what we had heard um, and so so yeah there's like definitely like a whole bunch of alligators like somewhere around uh, like down the road where we had had stopped uh, like kind of bellowing out and uh, <laughs> It's a really unnerving thing to hear when you're standing around in the pitch dark and then you just like suddenly hear this like low like rumble growl like right next to you. Um, so that was, that was interesting. Thank you so much for joining me on this one. I'd like to thank Sigma for letting me borrow this lens before its official release. It was a special treat to be one of the first people to use the world's first 14mm f1.4. I think some photographers might initially dismiss this lens for its size and weight, but I think it's important to remember that with this lens, the team at Sigma made something that no one has ever seen before. There are no other 14mm f1.4 lenses and the closest competing lenses are two-thirds of a stop slower. Being able to go to f1.4 gets you 60% more light gathering capability, and that can be the difference between being able to shoot a 6 second exposure and a 10 second exposure, or it can mean being able to capture 60% more frames in your time lapse, or being able to completely eliminate star trails without the need for a star tracker. If you can tolerate the extra heft in your kit, you'll know that you have that little bit of extra capability not possible with any other lens. 
Ultimately, especially when it comes to image quality, I have no hesitation recommending this lens as the best ultra-wide angle that I've ever used. With it, Sigma has pushed just a little bit the boundaries of what is possible in the realm of astrophotography.